Today's guest is a Takelma descendant and member of the Confederated Tribes of Silets Indians. He currently is on Ankala Puya Ilahi as curriculum director for the Traditional Ecological Inquiry Program, partnering with the Long Tom Watershed Council and tribal families to support environmental stewardship, promote food sovereignty, and explore traditional ways of knowing. He is a traditional ecologist and cultural fire practitioner and lifelong tribal teacher and learner. Welcome, Joe Scott. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. It's amazing to have you. I am so grateful that you agreed to be here and share about your program and the work that you do. Um, I think it's so important. The work that work you do is so crucial in this point in time where I think land is in such need of skilled tending and people are in such need of um, hope and remembering connection to the land and to fire. So I'd love to hear from you about how did you get started on your journey um, to becoming a cultural fire practitioner and what then led you to, to teach? Well, it's, it's, so it's, uh, it's sort of the scenic route. You know, it, it took me a while to, to um, bring the pieces together. And I think this is true of a lot of, um, a lot of indigenous people, a lot of tribal members in Western Oregon. Um, we have a, a common history of, um, forced displacement. And so, you know, our fires are so closely tied to our ecologies that to be removed from our ecologies is, you know, the act of removing us from our fire, um, you know, which is a really important part of colonization, of course, is separating indigenous people from, you know, the ecologies that have nurtured, you know, nurtured us since time immemorial uh, and setting us up uh, to be dependent in reservation situations, uh, dependent on resources um, to other people. So um, my story really kind of, you know, it starts from a very early age as a kid. Um, you know, I grew up in Corvallis uh, and my father was a fisheries and wildlife biologist. My mother was a school teacher. Um, we, so not a lot of, uh, not a lot of um, wealth <laughs> in the family uh, in those early days. So we spent a lot of time on the Siletz River and in the coast range, uh, hunting and fishing. And at every point along those journeys, you know, fire was really a part of that. Um, you know, whether it was uh, my father encouraging me to experiment with fire on the riverbank, um, you know, I, uh, to, you know, using the smoker, you know, there's a, uh, there's a lot of ways that cultural fire can be defined. Um, you know, cultural fire is is the medicines we we burn. It's it's the fires we set around oak trees and really everything in between. So, you know, my first exposure was was that was just basic hands on fire and a lot of stories. You know, a lot of stories about uh, you know a deep understanding, just a really uh, really clear understanding of the connection. Uh, you know, between biology, ecology, um, and uh, fire, just the, the, you know, the absolute necessity of fire as a foundational element to <clears throat> the living and non-living things all around us. So, like I said, it was kind of a scenic route, and uh, I had a really amazing opportunity in my uh, first, first few days, literally, at the Andrew Reasoner Preserve, which is the classroom for the traditional ecological inquiry program within those very first days you know we were up there uh burning you know looking at the the fall leaves and just like visioning uh what the landscape would look like burned and healthy and rejuvenated and you know in the four years since those early days uh we've brought indigenous people together to do um cultural fire trainings uh, we've gone off to various uh, training exchanges. Um, I had the, the opportunity to go to um, Yurok country and do a training exchange there uh, and meet some really awesome tribal folks working to restore um, traditional materials uh, for basketry, traditional foods, uh, tan oak acorns. You know, and these are things that, um, like I said, you know, they sustain us as a whole community. Um, so, 
yeah, it just got more and more exciting as as I approached this moment in my life where, you know, where I'm able to sort of channel that knowledge into um, education, community education in the tribal community. Mm, Long answer. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. And I'm sure there is a lot that you have to share from all your experiences and what you've learned. So what, um, so you're now working with young people mostly, is that correct? It's well, um, yeah, that's sort of the, the, the place where a lot of our work starts, uh, mm -hmm. is supporting, um, you know, young native people sort of at that middle school, high school age, that's, that's often challenging, you know, particularly challenging for, um, native kids mm -hmm. and, uh, we we work as much as we can embracing that age group um and and at the same time it's you know it's impossible really to work with uh work with young uh young people without including their families mm -hmm. and and by extension their communities so you know yes uh i work with young people but i also spend my time with you know, elders who want to share their knowledge with uh, tribal families that that want to share uh, in the teaching and learning process. Um, you know, uh, other representatives of the tribes who are, are interested in the work. So, you know, it's a lot. It's mm -hmm. a lot. I'm sure it is. Yeah, it sounds like such a wonderful opportunity for folks to get to get involved in this um, program and learn those those traditions so what what does a what does the program look like what do you um how do you work with uh with the people who attend speaking of fire uh, <laughs> right? yeah i told Ending. a little story earlier yeah i have to have a fire in the fireplace right now Love because it. yeah like not a lot of heat inside the house <laughs> so yeah. we do what we can plus you know it's fire there's yes. fire right so um yeah, to answer your question, which I've just now totally forgotten, um, like, <laughs> what does it look like? Uh, yeah, what, what does the program look like? look like? What do they get to learn? And um, yeah, let's start there. Well, you know, the bottom line is they get to learn what they're interested in learning. Uh, and our job is to sort of interpret um, their their interests and translate that into resources uh, mm -hmm. that support them to support their families and again, you know, to ultimately support the communities in uh, a learning process that's often very, you know, very closely tied to a specific um, ecological tradition or ecological knowledge that's, uh, you know, that's, that's been something in the family. That's something that drives the so, you know, like uh, beginning of a session, we go by the seasonal rounds. So, you know, our sessions are pretty much aligned with uh, solstices and equinoxes. At the beginning of a seasonal round, uh, we we spend time with their interests. We get to know them, them and their, you know, their whole community. Uh, you know where they are uh, with with their families, with the ecology they live in, um, where their interests are, and then just work with them uh, to design a, a project that addresses their interest uh, and also uh, uh, serves uh, traditional ecology. So frames it as traditional ecological knowledge, which you know traditional ecological science. So same time we can uh, sort of steer them towards college and uh, community uh, career readiness um, through uh, indigenous knowledge. That sounds really amazing. And it sounds like such a dramatically different approach to education from uh, what, um, what most of us are used to in this country. <laughs> and well, actually in Europe as well, I can speak to that because I grew up there, but um yeah that sounds like it makes so much more sense to it, educate yeah well absolutely it makes sense you know i i spent uh 
Oh, I don't know, about 15 years teaching in public schools mm. uh, for non-reservation years and then the rest um, on the Sluts Reservation and was able to both see um, what, uh, you know, my training, everything about it showed me what um, colonial, you know, the colonized version of education is. Uh, which is very focused on, you know, outcomes that are set by others, mm -hmm. uh, very focused on, um, you know, order, uh, really a top-down uh, approach to learning um, very purposely in a lot of ways, particularly I found this in the, you know, teaching on the reservation, really designed to sort of isolate mm -hmm. um, people from their uh, indigenous uh, knowledge um, mm -hmm. because it's not honored um, or recognized by Western science mm -hmm. or you know, it's not a part of Western values uh, in that context. So um, that, was, that was the challenge was, you know, what does it look like? What does it look like to do this in a good way for indigenous people? And it, it turned out to be what, what we've known all along, and, and that is that our learners uh, are, you know, things things come to them. You provide a stimulus-rich environment uh, mm -hmm. full of language, culture, uh, you know, things that matter to uh, young Indigenous folks, and uh, let them guide their path. Um, yeah. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Imagine a world where that is the norm. <laughs> I can't even, that would be that would be such a dramatically different world to live in than than what we live in right now. And wow. Yeah. Yeah, it, so it's an honor to be a part of something like that. And of course, you know, I just it's it's definitely worth mentioning that uh when you uh, have, which we do, an opportunity to expose um, Indigenous folks to fire, uh, to cultural fire, that's, that is of interest. Um, you know, young people are passionate about water, um, about air, air pollution, noise pollution, you know, the, the air, mm -hmm. uh, the earth, uh, the way, the way we interact with the earth and what's below it. Um, and, you know, all of those things I think are, are uh, accessible um, through the education systems that are kind of in place now. Fire is the element, like that foundational fundamental element <laughs> that, that has been missing um, from a lot of educational opportunities for, for tribal young, young indigenous people. So being able to provide that is, you know, that's, often the interest they have is reclaiming their, you know, their heritage of fire. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And yeah, so what's, what are the important pieces? What do we, like, maybe some highlights of what they learn in, in connection with using fire to tend the land? Is there, are there some little bits that you can share with us? There's, so there's the, uh, you know, there's a story to be told there, and it's it's about um, you know our ancestral knowledge and how we access that, uh, and where our you know our traditions come from, and what has happened to them since the long indigenous existence. Um, <clears throat> for most of us, those things have been taken away. Mm -hmm. For many of us, they have not. Um, you know, there are lots of tribal folks who are still practicing. Um, cultural fire uh, in their homelands as they have since time immemorial. Um, but, you know, for us, it's, uh, it's a big picture that involves abiding and incorporating the, you know, the, the legalese of fire, the, the sort of militarized version where, you know, there's an incident command structure and there are uniforms and there is, you know, common language and radios and, you know, all that safety equipment. 
And one of the things I think fundamentally that we work towards is undoing that narrative, undoing the danger fire narrative mm -hmm. and reclaiming it from the, uh, the sort of semi-military uh, institutions that, that have exerted control over fire over the last 150, 200 years. So just sharing that fundamental approach and sharing that, that knowledge, you know, that knowledge is in us. You know, we have access to it. There are mm -hmm. stories to be read. There are people to, to connect with. And, you know, bringing that whole network together, that's probably the biggest thing we do. And then from a practical standpoint, we provide um, access to land um, through our work with um, land stewards in a way that they can engage with these landscapes in a lifelong intergenerational way uh, to tend uh, first foods and uh, materials for, for cultural, um, uh, cultural materials, uh, Basketry is a really important thing that's that's dependent on fire. Mm -hmm. So it's just entering the whole process, you know, providing an entry to a, a cycle that just is endless. So, so it's sort of like jumping on a, you know, a merry-go-round uh, at any given point, you know, because there's, there's so many things tied together through fire, so many things that uh, fire brings together and, and reveals that, you know, just, just a, basic project uh you know is is something we do you know just hook someone up with a drip torch or explain how an adjacent ecology works like the materials used in medicine to treat burns you know it's uh there are medicines to treat the smoke in your lungs there's ways of of um you know doing projects that that ex you know that that share uh, information about all of those those sort of adjacent ecological um, uh, technologies, mm. um, not just the fire and not just the tending practices. So mm -hmm. lots of opportunities to learn uh, relative or related to fire there. Mm. Yeah, that sounds incredibly rich, uh, a rich experience to learn all these things. Yeah, and I... Um... Yeah, I appreciate the the difference in approach and in, in how to even look at fire when you just said the sort of more the trying to control and the danger in fire is sort of what we're hearing about on a daily basis, almost especially if we live uh, on the West Coast. Um, it's just something we hear about all the time. And I think for people to understand that that isn't necessarily how we need to come at this and that there is a different way. I think is a bigger picture would be so incredibly helpful. Is there, um, do you see any ways of, of like making that known <laughs> in a wider, in a wider way? How open do you think, I guess it's more the question, how open do you think people are to that understanding? Well, it, you know, it's a process of of sharing uh, of shared understanding. You know, we're particularly in this moment right now, right here, right now. You know, in the Pacific Northwest and and in the Southern Lamet Valley, uh, places that have been uh, that have surrounding communities that have been devastated by wildfire, mm -hmm. and you know, just saying the word fire is a trigger, you know, it's, it's a trauma that's shared among so many of us um, that it's, it can be hard to even start the conversation, but once you're engaged and once you start explaining and, and there's a clear evidence that, that, you know, indigenous fire science helps in wildfire mitigation helps, you know, maintaining healthy forests and landscapes. There is so much evidence mm -hmm. that, you know, once once you have an opportunity to really talk to people and communicate with people, um, the conversation inevitably leads to, you know, the good things that good fire can do. And the, really the point that that good fire belongs in the hands of indigenous people who've been using it here uh, as an ecological practice uh, since time immemorial, since the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's kind of a, a process of um, making people feel comfortable with, uh, you know, prescribed fire and then 
you know, emphasizing the point that prescribed fire is different than cultural fire. And that cultural fire is, you know, is a tool, is a technique that indigenous people can use uh, to serve a wider community. So, you know, those conversations are ongoing and, and there's a lot of amazing things happening, you know, collaborations between tribes and uh, like the BLM and the Forest Service. Um, there's a lot of amazing things happening. So mm. that's a lot of progress. Well, good. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that that you see that openness and that there is progress and it's, um, yeah, it's, the conversations are happening. I think so it sounds like overall, there's just a completely different orientation in being with nature uh, than, yeah, a different orientation. Is there a little more you can say about that? Well, mm, so the term nature, right? It's, it's a, you know, it, uh, I think it's, it's a useful tool in identifying the uh, space. Um, at the same time, you know, we are, nature is a community and we are part of that community. Um, so, you know, recognizing, I think, I think I may have just said a little bit about this earlier, just, you know, recognizing and appreciating that, you know, uh, the community, the, the whole community, the, you know, sometimes I think of it as a circle that goes under the ground a little bit, you know, that just sort of captures all of the things seen and unseen um, and recognizing that that, uh, you know, it's it's a whole thing that that human beings are a part of it. Four legged, two legged, no legged, you know, on all of the things in it are part of that community. So not sure if that answers the question. Um, yeah, it does. Yeah, I do find that that is something that as a, well, backing up a little bit, we hear a lot about like all different kinds of ecological issues and crises right now. And um, I think the bigger issue underneath all of that, those are all symptoms, but the bigger in issue underneath all of that is that so many individuals have completely disconnected uh, from themselves from nature and from each other. And so to, to sort of bring that back and get people to connect again, reconnect, I think is critically important at this time. And I'm so, so grateful that you're helping with that. You're, do, you're doing it, like you're on the ground actually doing it. And I think that is so fantastic. So incredibly inspiring. Do you have it's, any? It's, a, it's, a super, it's an honor, you know, it's an honor that has been, and I feel like it's sort of been bestowed upon me. Mm. Uh, and I, it's something that's just taken on as a responsibility. Um, it's good work. You know, it's, I feel, it feels good to do these things. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any sort of any thoughts, any tips for like any person how to who is hearing about this for the first time, how to nurture that um, connection within themselves? It's, I, I think, um, you know, this is just from, from my perspective, I lived a very disconnected life for a very long time. And, you know, just spending time, uh, spending time outside, you know, literally connecting to the ground. Um, you know, it's, it's something that is, you know, a really important philosophical, um, just a reality for in a lot of indigenous communities. Uh, you go into the longhouse uh, at U of O, and there is a literal way to connect with the ground there, um, a place to put your feet. Um, and so just first recognizing that connection and establishing the fact that you are part you know, understanding and recognizing that you are a part of this thing. Uh, that right there is a step towards that reintegration of yourself with this larger community. Mm. So it's got to be something that that is, you know, your journey. It was something that I had to find for myself. And, you know, I just I, I looked in the community and, and found people who were, you know, supported that that journey. And uh, that's, you know, it's an it's an ongoing process you know recognizing the the 
you know, the kindness and grace it takes mm -hmm. uh, to live in as much harmony as possible in this just very disconnected world. Mm -hmm. um, that's very, very different than what our, our ancestors lived with in so many ways. Um, you know, finding your way is really what it's about. Mm. Finding your way. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think that's important for, for people to understand and to connect with again. I guess the one thing I would like to touch on a little more as well is I, you talked about finding your way and how much do you think finding the way and being living in harmony with nature again and being part of understanding that it's all is connected, everything is connected. How much do you think that in impacts individuals' health and then the planet's health in, in how we how we are in it and on it <laughs> well it you know recognizing that you, that that fundamental recognition that fundamental recognition of your existence within this community just starts to uh fill in that that emptiness i think that a lot of people feel um can you can you say that one more time? Yeah, there <laughs> was a lot in there, in and it wasn't right very <laughs> precise. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, that's okay. Um. So yeah, it. How I guess how does the um the reconnecting with with the understanding that we're all connected and that we're all part of nature? How do you think that impacts? individual's health and the planet's health as a result as well. So yeah, now I remember what I was thinking about. Um, it, it puts you in charge, you know, it, it ends up empowering you. If you see yourself in this larger system, you know, all of a sudden you're a part of a thing that's that's working, you know, that that is out of balance, but still, you know, is is functioning. And and you can see, I think you can see those things more clearly, the places where, you know, there's suffering, the places where there are great things going on, and everything in between, um, because you're tuned in, you know, mm -hmm. you're paying attention, because you, you are a part of something that sustains you, and that ultimately, in this reciprocal relationship, you sustain, that you have a responsibility to, you know, that it's important, and that you as an individual human being matter like you matter what you do matters the way you walk on the earth matters um and you know that's empowering to understand that to embrace that you know that makes it matter that the air is clean you know that makes it matter that good fire is being used to tend the land and you know reveal the good things that have been hidden so far you know it makes you care about the food you eat it makes mm -hmm. you care about other people and it makes you care about yourself so yeah Mm, wow. Yeah. Mattering. That is a big, a big piece. Yes. And mm, wow. <laughs> just really taking in a lot of what you said just there. Yeah. The mattering, I think is something that a lot of people don't necessarily connect with right now because I'm seeing um, in general, there's so much fear. There's so much sort of hopelessness right now happening. And the knowing and the understanding that it starts with me, I can actually do something about that. I am part of the system. And like you said, clean air, clean water, nutritious food, all these things are things I get to do something about. I get to, you know, pick whichever one is most important to me and step in and do something to bring about change. And that is an incredibly inspiring message right there. Thank you for that. We we wow. started out at the, you know, the the traditional ecological inquiry program really is is uh you know, we have the privilege of working with and on a piece of property that's under a conservation easement, you know, that essentially guarantees to the best to the extent that that's possible in this modern world. Um, that we have access, that indigenous people have lifelong access to this property, and that life, you know, that access continues through generations. Um, 
you know, there are families that are tending resources now and have been for years and they know they can go there. And when we first arrived, it, you know, it contains just this little bit, this tiny little bit of remnant um, Valley Oak Savanna. And uh, that Valley Oak Savanna is so critically endangered. There is so little of it left mm -hmm. um, that it would, I think it would be pretty easy to just give up, to just give up and say, there's so little of this left. You know, it's like a species that has been reduced to one member. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, it's the end of the line. It would be, I think it would be easy and convenient um, to just say, you know, this, this is the end of something, but, you know, it turns out it's really worth it. And that the type of restoration that we're doing, you know, one tree at a time, one plant at a time, one little meadow at a time that, that it matters, you know, mm -hmm. it, it matters and it's important that those ecologies exist. You know, because again, they're part of this this whole community. And when you remove uh, parts of your community, it's less. You know, it's mm -hmm. less for them. So, mm, yeah, I have a friend who always says, "What I do to myself, I do to the earth. What I do to the earth, I do to myself." So that um, that just reminded me um, that yes, everything we do matters, and it's all so helpful to have to have that bigger picture understanding and that we get to do these things we get to we get to take care of the environment we're in and we get to do it well yeah is there anything else you would like to share about about the program uh, itself well i would mention that um you know we're we're always so the program you know a lot of times I think, well, it's a question I hear, you know, how can we support indigenous communities? I, I think there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people who say they want to, uh, and I, I'd very much like to believe that they really do uh, mm -hmm. want to support um, tribal communities. Um, one way that that happens is through supporting programs that create situations, essentially, that set young people up for success. Mm -hmm. That set um, young indigenous people up with opportunities to explore indigeneity uh, through whatever, whatever it is, through art, through um, cultural activities, through language. Um, there are programs out there, lots of programs supporting um, tribal youth. And I, that's where I work is in that uh, realm. And so, you know, supporting the traditional ecological inquiry program is a way to support the tribal community. You know, there, like I said, you know, there's the 4J natives program, there's Chiffin, there, there are a variety of, um, of entities, organizations, there are Chatumenma, uh, lots of, lots of opportunities to support um, things like that. And yeah, all shamelessly promote the traditional yes. ecological inquiry program as a place to offer support so absolutely absolutely and we'll put the link uh underneath in the description as well but it is uh longtime.org forward slash community forward slash t-e-i-p and that um so us. yeah pardon that's us that's you yes so if you feel called to support there is a way to do that uh, so please please go ahead and and help out uh, well, I do want to thank you so much for, for taking the time to be here and to share about the program. I think this is such, such, such important work you're doing, and I'm so grateful you're, you're doing it, and I'm so grateful we got to hear about it and learn about it. Um, thank you. Thank you. It's been such an honor to talk with you. It's, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for offering this, this opportunity to share. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you.